to Money, 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 your weekly personal finance aid with me, Surabhi Upadhyay. Budget 2019 hasn't ushered in too many sops for the common man, but it does seek to increase tax on the super rich. There's some relief if you're looking to buy an affordable home, and there is higher tax burden when it comes to life insurance policies. We will decode the fine print of the budget in this week's show, and joining me to do that are Ashish Shankar, Head Investment Advisory at Motilal Oswal Private Wealth Management, Preeti Kurana, Chief Editor at ClearTax, and in a bit we'll also have with us Sanjeev Bajaj, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Bajaj Capital. Thank you very much for being with us on the show. So it's uh, you know we're just getting through all the uh, the you know fine print and the impact of some of the budget measures. And uh, Ashish, I'm going to start with you. I'm sure a lot of your clients, the super rich, would not have been too happy with this year's budget. Yes, yeah, Surbhi. I mean, first of all, it's a, always a pleasure to be on your show. Um, the tax increase this time has been very, very steep for super rich and nice. Uh, earlier, you had uh, one slab, which was a surcharge of 15% for incomes above 1 mm -hmm. crore. This time around, they've introduced two new slabs, which is for incomes between 2 to 5 crores and 5 crores and above. Uh, and the surcharge is very steep. So between 2 to 5 crores, it's about 25%. Mm. So 15 becomes 25% for this category. For this five category. Crores, yeah. And 5 crore and above, it becomes 37%. Yeah. So okay. that's 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 a that's a large increase. Now mm -hmm. uh, it's understandable why the government has done this because mm -hmm. uh, the GST as well as uh, the rest of the tax collection numbers have been scaled down. Mm -hmm. So they had to find more taxes from the personal tax segment. Mm -hmm. uh, if they didn't want to tax the common man, which is people mm -hmm. with lower incomes, they had to rely on this category of investors. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, it also uh, not just that it is very very steep it also opens up all kinds of other arbitrage in terms of taxation which which we can uh, talk Absolutely. about a little later we, in the show. we will talk about that yeah. because it's had a sort of a multiplier effect on on several other aspects Absolutely. as well including the the capital gains tax regime right. itself let's bring in Preeti Preeti so you know as Ashish said the hope this year was that maybe there'll be some tax regime which gives money in the hands of the common man that's not happened, but your takeaway uh, on some of these changes, specifically on the hike in surcharge. Right. So, uh, you know, in my view, we have to look at both the interim and the July budget as a single, uh, uh, you know, in a single approach because both the budgets actually apply to the same financial year, which is 2019-20. So, if you look at it holistically, of course, those people who are earning up to 5 lakhs, those who are able to restrict their taxable income to 5 lakhs, will pay zero tax. And then HNIs who are uh, beyond 2 crores or above 5 crores will end up paying higher tax. Now, uh, the approach of the government has been to keep increasing this surcharge like if you do a historical review you will see that surcharge has been increasing consistently and in fact uh, as of today at 37 percent it's even higher than the 30 percent rate itself so surcharge is pretty high I think it needs a completely different approach to the way we want to tax uh, people so uh, they have to sort of look at better and innovative ways of taxing of shoring up revenues uh, but this is actually you know uh, sort of been very steep so 47 uh, percent uh, you know 42 percent almost for those who are super rich pretty steep in my view well the counter preview that I heard uh, some people uh, put out was that you know it's actually not really out of line because some of the developed economies as well for instance the US also has a peak rate of close to 40 percent for those who are quite rich uh, would you agree So in that sense, you know, if you look at purely the tax rates, I mean, you have to look at other indicators also. What are the benefits that come when you pay your taxes? Uh, what are your health services like? What are your security services like? And those have not significantly changed. So this uh, appears to be only as an objective, you know, where you're able to slightly increase revenues. There's not much impact on the revenues if you look at it uh, from a collection standpoint. It appears more as like, you know, a strategic, uh, aim to sort of tax the super rich which is easier and use the surcharge route. Now when you increase the surcharge what happens is that the center gets the entire revenue whatever direct tax collections happen those are also sort of in some complex way distributed to the states but whatever surcharge collections happen those directly go to the central government. Sure I, I take your point yes this is what experts have pointed out that the fact that the surcharge collection goes only and only to the central government and that's uh, perhaps uh, their way of ensuring that their tax kitty doesn't look too poor. 
Uh, but what has happened, uh, Ashish, as we just discussed, is that there is a spillover effect. Yes. Uh, what we realized was that obviously surcharge is going to be applicable to the long-term capital gains tax or even the short-term capital gains yeah. tax. And because of this steep hike in surcharge, now the rates of tax on capital gains go up as well. Right. Uh, what impact is this having on HNI investment and just the, the entire approach? So if you look at the 2 to 5 crore and 5 mm -hmm. crore plus category, what happens now is that even the short term capital gains as well as the long term capital gains uh, go up mm -hmm. because of the surcharge. So the long term capital gains now go up to as high as close to 14% right. for super HNIs yeah. uh, yeah. who are earning more than 5 crores mm -hmm. and the short term capital gains go about 20%. Now what happens then is for, especially for equity, equity oriented mm -hmm. mutual funds, mm -hmm. the dividend plan becomes more attractive because the dividend plan has a base taxation of 10% plus 12% surcharge. So okay. uh, I, I think it opens up uh, the route for more tax planning and people will have to revisit uh, how they build their mutual fund portfolio. So if you could elaborate on this, how is it that the dividend route of mutual funds will still be more tax efficient? Right. So for example, uh, let's assume that I put uh, uh, money in the growth plan. Mm -hmm. Now if I put money and in And you're talking about someone who is in, let's assume in the, in the 5 crore Plus bracket, plus, plus where plus the peak bracket. tax rate now stands at 42.7%. Yes. And the LTCG rate, just to be clear about it, if you are earning over 5 crores, uh, then the long term capital gains tax liability is now about 14.2% uh, for, right. for this category. That's of, right. The uh, base rate is 10%. With right. the surcharge, it goes up to 14.2%. So if I invest in the growth plan mm -hmm. and I were to redeem my equity mutual fund before one year, mm -hmm. short term capital gains uh, gets gets applied. Which is around 21.5%. Uh, which is 15% plus the 37% surcharge, surcharge yeah. it goes up to 2021 percent yes whereas if I take the income by way of dividends mm -hmm. then what happens is that the dividend taxation applies before the dividend is paid out but in the hands of the HNI the entire money is tax-free so the dividend taxation is 10 percent plus 12 percent surcharge so the total taxation comes to about 11.45 percent okay. so 11.45 percent compared to 21 percent is a huge a huge a huge arbitrage big so, uh, so that's one mm -hmm. second even if you look at the long-term capital gains mm -hmm. if I book out of an equity oriented mutual fund after a year, the total tax that I pay is 14% because mm -hmm. the base taxation is 10% mm -hmm. and, and you, then the surcharge. you pay the surcharge yeah. of 37%. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you take the dividend plan, you still end up paying only 11.45%. Okay. So in both cases, the mm -hmm. dividend plan becomes uh, more attractive, especially for somebody who's investing in an equity oriented uh, mutual sure, fund. Sure. So similarly for debt investors, mm -hmm. arbitrage uh, funds become that much more attractive because okay. in arbitrage funds, you can take the dividend, dividend reinvestment plan mm -hmm. and get a get a higher uh, tax free income so so do you see a preference for dividend plans now across the mutual fund spectrum yes definitely in fact okay. uh, uh, a lot of hnis are relooking at their portfolios mm -hmm. and trying mm -hmm. to see how best to uh, mm -hmm. plan uh, uh, the portfolio from a tax aspect so it would actually go slightly against the overall thesis of wealth management because i'm sure i mean you know experts like you would not uh, advise dividends unless you really require the money it's, the growth plans have always been uh, promoted and propagated right yeah absolutely because you get the effect of compounding in a yes, growth plan yes yes uh, but uh, uh, after this uh, uh, you know new clause uh, tax hike, uh, you, yeah. you you'll have to look at uh, you know the post tax aspect and uh, we would recommend a dividend reinvestment plan in, okay. in lieu of a growth plan. So the money okay. keeps gets reinvested back into the fund. Okay. But the total amount of cash that you have in your hand at the at the uh, end of the tenor is is much more than if you were if were invested in the growth plan. All right. Uh, do stay on. We need to take a very quick break. When we come back on the other side, we also talk about a small hit that's coming in on your life insurance policies because there is a there is an increase in the tax deducted at source even there. Back in a moment with that. Welcome back, you're watching Money, Money, Money and this week we are decoding the fine print of the budget and yes, there are quite a few hits that we uh, seem to be going over. One is of course the uh, higher surcharge and its impact on capital gains. The other, and this was also, you know, sort of tucked in somewhere in the nitty gritties and the details, is an increase in TDS. Uh, on your life insurance policies. Now, how, how is this going to really play out? Whom does it impact? Let's get some thoughts in. Sanjeev Bajaj, VC and MD of Bajaj Capital is with us on the phone line from New Delhi. Sanjeev, thanks for joining in. The devil is always in the detail, right? And one, two, three days later, we realize that the hits keep coming. Uh, now, explain this whole tedious concept uh, to us and how will it work on life insurance policies? 
Yeah, what is going to happen now is that earlier there was there are two types of policies. One which are tax free, which come under 1010D, where the sum assured is more than 10 times of the premium that you are paying. That policies will continue to remain tax free, thankfully. But there are policies which are taxable, with, especially in case of single premiums, or where the tax the life cover is not 10 times the uh, of of the premium that you are paying. In those policies, now 5% of the net gain is going to get taxed. Earlier, what was happening was that there was a tedious deduction of 1% of the of the total amount. Now they have clarified rather than the total amount, they, it is going to be 5% of the net gain. So, which is uh, uh, slightly the only positive in that is that 5% is high, but the only positive in that is that they have clarified that only the gain will be taxed and TDS is only being cut on the gain. Earlier what was happening in case of these policies like single premium where 1010D cover condition was not met of 10 times cover, mm -hmm. sometimes the whole uh, maturity proceeds used to be treated as income. At least that is not going to happen now. Okay. But you, uh, for an investor or a policy holder, he has to be very clear mm -hmm. that when you are buying a life insurance policy, please look at the sum insured okay. and it is your duty to ensure that it is at least 10 times of the premium premium that you are paying, otherwise it won't be tax free for you. Okay, okay Sanjeev, yeah. so that, that's the first very important point that I think we need to keep in mind that if you're going in for life insurance, make sure that your sum assured is at least 10 times of the premium that you're paying because otherwise there's a tax implication. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, is there any distinction between term plans or market link policies or ULIPs or is it applicable to any life insurance policy which doesn't offer 10 times the premium? No, see, term plan is only pure protection, so in case mm -hmm. it is not applicable on term plan, but okay. in case of whether it is any investment-based policy, whether it is uh, unit-linked or traditional plan, it is going to be applicable on all the plans which don't meet the 1010D condition, which is 10 times the life cover. Okay, so at least term plans have been spared, that's one good news. Now, uh, if you could just illustrate this via a small example, you know, let's say there is a, uh, yeah, there is a market link policy or even if it's a traditional plan, where the sum assured is not 10 times the premium, uh, then what part of it will actually sort of be taxed? If you could just illustrate it with a you know, simple example. Yeah, so a lot of people buy a single premium policy to save tax under Section 80C. So suppose you have bought a 1 lakh policy. Hmm. Earlier what used to happen, maturity was 1 lakh 40,000 after 5 years. So they would keep 1% of 1 lakh 40,000 as a TDS since the 10 time cover was not condition was not met. Hmm. Now what they will, they have clarified that they will keep 5% of 40,000 rupees, which is the net gain, which is the total amount returned minus the premium paid. Okay. And 5% of that amount will be kept as a TDS till you file your returns uh, to show that uh, you are not taxable or, so it's going to become slightly more tedious, hmm. uh, you know, to get your money back. Okay, all right, Sanjeev. Thanks for explaining that to us. Uh, really appreciate it. So that's something that perhaps one will have to keep in mind uh, while taking an insure, uh, while taking a decision on life insurance as well. Many thanks, uh, Sanjeev, for joining in and talking to us about this. Um, you know, Preeti, you want to come in on this because this also uh, sort of uh, somewhere in the fine print. This is also a bit of a you know issue that's coming up. And again, going back to the point, tax is going to become a determining factor in terms of the kind of policies also perhaps that you need to buy. Right. Uh, but, you know, I look at it more in terms of clarity because this was an issue that a lot of people were facing, uh, you know, when they would get their summer short if it exceeded rupees 1 lakh, which is the threshold uh, mentioned for uh, receipts from life insurance. And if it exceeded rupees 1 lakh, you were subject to 1% TDS. Now, the TDS rate is 5%. But TDS is simply a monitoring mechanism. It only means now that the government knows that you've received some money, which has to be your taxable income. Uh, the TDS amount will go up but if you look at uh, the approach it's uh, it's a lot of clarity it's a relief for people who were uh, getting money from their life insurance and then you know ended up having a much higher TDS in terms of value uh, and so this is this is actually a positive move okay fair enough that's on insurance uh, another asset class where at least there's some good news because we didn't have too many pieces of good news in this budget right Ashish was on uh, housing at least on affordable housing so the uh, you know the deduction that you can claim on the interest that goes up from two lakhs to uh, three and a half lakhs now. Right. 
uh, but do you think this will really uh, sort of uh, find takers does it does it really sort of help people so they've introduced a new section whereby mm -hmm. uh, uh, people who buy the first first time first time purchase mm -hmm. of a house to 45 lakhs mm -hmm. can avail of an additional deduction of one and a half lakhs mm -hmm. uh, in the interest of housing loan mm -hmm. so the total deduction that you can get on the interest is about three and a half lakhs mm -hmm. uh, the concern here is that I, I don't know whether anybody can utilize this this entire limit because mm -hmm. let's assume you buy a 45 lakh house and utilize mm -hmm. the entire limit and even if you take a 90 percent LTV from a from a bank mm -hmm. uh, you end up taking a loan of let's say about uh, 38 39 lakhs mm -hmm. uh, now the interest component on that I don't see it reaching three and a half lakhs per annum. Okay, so uh, it's a bit of a wasted uh, sort of increase uh, there. Absolutely, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think given the uh, state of the real estate sector, mm -hmm. I think any relief uh, mm -hmm. is 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 welcome, and and mm -hmm. I think most developers uh, will take it. Uh, it is also applicable more for tier two, tier three towns, uh, sure, uh, because sure. I I don't see uh, you know in Bombay uh, someone being able to buying a house for forty five lakhs. Uh, I don't think it's really lakhs. happening. Yeah, uh, Preeti, just to clarify this, and this is a query that kind of came up um, from one of our viewers as well. Well, if someone wants to, let's say, you know, invest in an affordable house and then avail this provision, I mean, you can buy a house for 30, 35 lakhs, and then you want to avail of this higher deduction, but the individual himself or herself is still living in a in a rented property, you know, in Bombay. So I don't know how you can sort of get around the provisions. Can you claim both HRA benefit and also this higher deduction? Absolutely, you can do that. The condition here is that this is the first time uh, that you would be owning a house. When you're taking this loan, you should not be owner of any house property. Now, if you're claiming an HRA, the HRA is actually linked to, uh, you know, if you're staying near to your workplace, you have to be closer to where you live. Uh, and that's why you need to take a rented accommodation. That makes you eligible for HRA. And when you're taking a housing loan, that has a separate set of conditions. So if you take up this housing loan, definitely you'll be able to claim the interest deduction and on top of it because you're living in a rented accommodation because of uh, you know uh, staying closer to your workplace or being in the same city as your workplace you will be eligible to claim HRA and on the affordable housing I would like to add that they've also added another section which is ATIBA they've extended uh, that to the builders when they'll be able to claim tax relief they'll be able to claim deductions for building this affordable housing uh, so it's both ways uh, it's also for the investors uh, they may not be able to fully exhaust the three and a half lakh limits, but it's also an encouragement to the builders. So they'll uh, be able to claim a reduction when they develop uh, affordable housing. Okay, there you go. So you can perhaps look at a house in tier two, tier three. If you're in Mumbai, you know, I have small chance of finding a house in 45 lakhs. But maybe if you're looking at tier two, tier three, then there could be an avenue opening up there. We need to take a break. On the other side, uh, some more takeaways from the budget, including this interoperability between PAN, your PAN number, as well as your Aadhaar card. We'll talk about that on the other side. watching money 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 and we are decoding the budget looking at the fine print and all the nuances that this year's budget threw up uh, before we uh, sort of talk about the final takeaways uh, there were some more announcements uh, you know we did hear Preeti for instance the finance minister talking about how one can quote either PAN or Aadhaar uh, in documentation and even for the purpose of income tax return filing etc uh, there's also talk about uh, this pre-filled uh, income tax returns so if you could explain to us how that will work. Correct. Right. So if you look at PAN and Aadhaar, what the government has now said is that anywhere uh, in the Income Tax Act, if you make, need to make any document submissions, you can use your Aadhaar instead of PAN. And if you're filing your tax returns, let's say you don't have a PAN, then you can use your Aadhaar. And on the basis of Aadhaar, a PAN will be allotted. Now, a lot of people are actually wondering if PAN has become redundant. But PAN is actually much wider usage because uh, companies uh, and other non-individual uh, entities, uh, they use the PAN and the rest of the financial ecosystem which is uh, basically you know all your banking and investing that is still on PAN because Aadhaar has certain restrictions some uh, privacy concerns and its usage is consent based so therefore uh, you know Aadhaar for now it seems like for all your income tax compliance Aadhaar becomes a primary document but for the rest of it PAN continues to be relevant on the pre-filling of tax returns the government has uh, added a certain fields up until last 
last year they were prefilling certain aspects of your tax return but now they have gone a step further they are populating your tax return based on the TDS return filed by your employer so your employer files a TDS return where they specify the income that has been paid to you the tax has been uh, that has been deducted and based on this document they are prefilling your tax return they are also using your form 26AS let's say if you have uh, uh, you have rental income and somebody has deducted TDS on that rent then your rental income will get auto populated in your tax return mm -hmm. so a lot of new changes uh, previously also they were populating details like you know your father's name your address your bank account information but now they've gone a step further but I would still highly recommend that if you're using any sort of pre-filling it's a must that you actually go through your tax return and review each and every field and make sure that this is exactly what you want it to be okay fair enough so at least some of that laborious work is going to be done by the tax man himself in the year to come uh, final thoughts and Ashish to sum it up I mean I guess for the HNI clients and with this whole issue about trusts getting taxed and you know, some of the FPIs also getting taxed uh, the sentiment isn't very positive but what is the takeaway now that this big budget event is behind us yeah so uh, like I mentioned uh, this uh, surcharge uh, hike is very very steep mm -hmm. uh, but I think people will get over it mm. it is also understandable uh, why the government has done this because they are resource constrained and uh, like Preeti mentioned that the surcharge goes directly to the uh, central government mm. I just hope that you know given the mandate that, that they've got they also move to a simplified tax regime for individuals mm -hmm. they have already done that on indirect taxes through the introduction of GST I hope they do that till then these arbitrage and loopholes do exist because even if you look at a company structure today a company up to 400 cost turnover uh, the taxation is only 25 percent mm. so I'm sure uh, uh, accountants will get very very uh, creative mm. uh, which is which is not very desirable so I just hope that over the course of this uh, uh, you know mandate uh, mm. next four years they they look at introducing the direct tax code and making the individual taxation structure also a little 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 simpler mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that will that will that will essentially uh, ensure that there is consistency. Uh, today mm -hmm. today there are there are still loopholes. I mean they had to plug the buyback loophole uh, mm -hmm. in in this budget earlier. There was an arbitrage between a buyback and, and, and dividend yeah. paid out by companies. Mm -hmm. So now by with this twenty percent withholding mm -hmm. tax, they've they've plugged that. I'm tempted to think that they will do that uh, for HNIs as well between dividend and capital gains. But I think any kind of relief is welcome given the given the mm -hmm. steep steep hike. So I think people will get over it. And if you look at the numbers, about thirty thousand tax filers are affected hmm. Uh, hmm. so that's that's the government's uh, you know larger larger view to give benefit to uh, let's say 99.9% mm -hmm. of the population they chose to uh, take a little more money from the, from the from 30,000 odd super absolutely. rich that we have in the country absolutely. well let's see what the coming days bring if we have any changes uh, in the months ahead but for now this is the way the law stands thank you very much Ashish and Preeti for joining in and uh, demystifying some of the provisions of the budget that's it on this week's show we'll see you again with another theme next week thank you for watching